Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the f this is the first time when I when I look out and I could say roughly forty five percent of the audience should be at the table. Okay, everybody here. I mean, you know, we've got. Uh, Partly that's because everybody here is uh, so knowledgeable, and partly because we kind of need everybody to try to understand this problem that, that we're looking at. Uh, but we're really glad that you're here, and I'm really counting on the kind of the very interactive nature of what I hope will be a good discussion today. We'll, we'll bring this out and try to help illuminate for all of us uh, what uh, I'll say for me is the most confusing time I've experienced. I've been in Washington for uh, 40 years, which is, uh, I'm trying to figure out how that happens since I don't feel older than 25, but that's a, and uh, I've been in and around um, uh, politics uh, and policy for 35 of these years. And I, and I must confess, I have never been more alarmed uh, at the uh, state uh, that we're in than I am now. Um, and it's, uh, you know, there's been a lot, it's, we're not the topic of today. I'm perfectly happy to pontificate on this at another time. But I mean, I think we've been seeing a long-term, steady deterioration of the quality of politics in America. But it is now come to, uh, in, m in my mind, it's come to a crisis. Now, I'm, I'm not uh, anti-politics. Uh, actually, politics is essential. Good politics is essential. I mean, there are only three ways that nations make big decisions. You know, one is in, in the marketplace where you, people say, I'm willing to try to produce something and sell it at a price. People want to buy it. And the marketplace helps you decide what we're going to do. That's one. Second is we establish a set of administrative procedures, administrative legal procedures that kind of establish broad outlines of acceptable and unacceptable activity in society. And we have, when we pre-establish a mechanism for dealing with that, and when problems come up, you can put it into that administrative channel. And the, there's only the third way, and that's politics, where you're setting, you're sorting out the major choices that countries have to make, and there isn't a framework, either a marketplace or a framework, to do it. So you have to have politics. Politics is, is essential. Politics is crucial. But politics has is, is always been coupled with governing. Until now, I'm afraid. You know, it's always been the competition of the two parties to advance their interests by being better, in better parties to run the government, and better ideas to run the government. But, you know, ultimately, you know, running the government is about compromise. And we're now living in an era where politics is about not compromising. I mean, the, the, the Committee of Twelve actually had a solution a month ago. It all worked out. The staff had worked out the solution. The members had largely agreed to it. It was worked out. And politics interrupted. Politics today needs the problem more than it needs the solution. Now, uh, you know, it, it produced this completely unstable outcome that we had from last summer. I mean, we, we had we had, you know, the two parties each seeing an existential battle, both of the minority parties now, seeing an existential battle with each other, you know, came to grips with each other, arm wrestling over the debt ceiling extension. And all of a sudden, we were facing the prospect of a default on America. Can you imagine what that'd be like? I mean, look at the chaos that's going on in Europe now when they're talking about Greece defaulting, for Christ's sakes. You know, 2% of the European economy. And we were talking about America defaulting on its bonds. So to avoid that, you know, we come up with this process where we pick a committee of 12 and ask them to resolve the problem. And then we put this sequester thing on top of them, this discipline 
you know? Well, first of all, the inherent problem with this, with this was we took 25% of the problem and made it carry 100% of the answer. I mean, discretionary spending, at best, only constitutes 25% of the deficit problem. And yet it was the only thing that we could run because Democrats took entitlements off the table, Republicans took taxes off the table. The only thing they could agree on was to let 25% carry 100% of the answer. Well, obviously that's unstable. It's unstable because it's a crisis that doesn't solve the problem. You know. And then we take and say, well, if 535 members of Congress can't figure it out, maybe 12 will figure it out. You know, and we put them in a fishbowl with everybody in the world looking at them and say, you guys figure it out. You know, and of course it, it politics did to the Committee of Twelve what they did to themselves. I mean, we just, this is, this is, no. Does this matter, you know, for a Defense Department? It sure as hell does matter. This is the only department, I mean, 90% of the rest of the government does one of two things. Write a check to a beneficiary or write a check to an employee. We actually build things. We run things. We invest in things. We manage 70 years worth of technology at any one point in time. We're trying to keep B-52s flying at the same time we're trying to design an F-35. You know. We, we you know, major long-term resources. You know, we're running the largest daycare center in the world. We've got the eighth largest grocery chain in the world. We've got the biggest school system in the world. We've got 350,000 vehicles. You know, I mean, it's just a massive enterprise. We have to, to run this thing. We have to have a central integrating process to pull it together so it's coherent over time. And it is coherent over time. How do we know? It's because when we have to fight a war, in a week we can have 800 combat aircraft in a, in a distant theater with all the maps, with the ammunition, with the fuel, with the pilots, with the war plans. We can do that in a week. You know, I mean, that, you know people say, well, how do you measure success? How do you measure management defenses? Well, we fight wars. We win them, and we can do that. This process that we have lets us have that kind of coherence. And yet, I think this indecision is putting this process seriously at risk, because the centerpiece of it, of course, is the programming process. Now, I used to be the comptroller, and of course, all comptrollers think the world revolves around them, you know, and that the budgeting process is the most important part of the building. Well, it's not. It's the programming process. You know, I mean, I, you know, when I did a lot of budgets when I was there, and, you know, building a budget is like painting a portrait of the Mona Lisa with brush strokes, but you're looking through a, a microscope applying a brush stroke, you know, because it's, uh, you know, thousands of little decisions, you know. Well, you could step back and say, geez, I got the nose on upside down. You'd never know that in the budget process. You'd never know the coherence of your budget by just doing the budget. The coherence comes from the programming process because that's where you establish your long-term planning trajectories. That's where you connect your sense of requirements, your assessment of threat and risk, and you bounce it against your, your constraints, and you develop long-term coherent plans in the, in the programming review. But what does the programming review require? It requires a predictable top line. Now, the top line can change, and we've seen some dramatic change, but it requires a predictable environment for us to do this. Now, what do we have? We've got, um, we're marching into a year where the law of the land says it'll be a sequester. And every politician says, we're never going to do that. You've all heard them, right? We're never going to do that. The law of the land says we're going to do a sequester. Now, so what does that say to the department? How does the department run this? 
do we say, well, I don't care what the law of the land says. We're never going to do that. Of course not. But does the department anticipate and foreclose the politics that still is unresolved and take on itself damaging cuts? I mean, I, you know, the, you know, the president says he will veto anybody that tries to change the sequester. And the Secretary of Defense says the sequester will crush and hurt American security. Okay, I'm sorry, those two don't reconcile very well. And yet that's the path we're on. And it is, the consequences of this are far bigger than just the gaming politics to get through the 2012 election. You know, the fundamental coherence of our long-term defense planning is at risk here. I'm sorry, I know that sounds apocalyptic, but I, I actually did several of these things, and I, and I know how crucial it is to have this work, and that is what's at risk right now. So um, part of our doing this is uh, for the people in town, look, we all, we all love the politics of Washington. I mean, that's, but we all depend on the governing of Washington. We depend on this being a competent, coherent, governing entity that produces good results for everybody in this country. And that's now at risk. So we've got to do something about it. It's so one thing about America. If you don't like where you're heading, you can do something about it. And that's what we're going to try to do today. So we've, we've called from among us uh, four fine intellects that have been in the middle of all of it, they're only going to be the guys that start this conversation. All of you are going to have to be the ones that continue it. So I'd ask you to be very active. And we're not going to be able to stop with just a one-off event to say, okay, well, we got that out of our system. You know, I mean, this, this is a problem we're going to have to wrestle with all this year. And everybody here is going to have to do it. Okay, David, why don't you get everybody up here for real and let's have this thing started for real. I apologize for my little sermonette, but I have to get it out of my system. Thanks for coming here today. Thanks, John. I think we recorded that. So you'll be able to find it on the web. You may want to play it for your friends, especially those who actually should be on the receiving end of the sermonette because I suspect most people in this room have already got that part figured out. Um, I'm David Berto. I'm the director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group and the director of the International Security Program here at CSIS, and I'm very, very grateful to all of you for being here today. Um, Dr. Hammer's right. I look out at this audience, and, and this room is full of people who all should be up here on the platform. Um, uh, however, um, there's not enough room on the platform and you'll all have your opportunity. I would remind you two things. Number one, silence your electronic devices so that uh, they won't interfere. Uh, those of you who are uh, uh, watching on the web, you can play yours for all this worth because we can't hear you. Um, I also want to remind you this event is on the record. Um, so uh, occasionally we tend to forget that when we're here in this enterprise, but uh, particularly I want to remind my panelists of that. Um, I want to retrace a little bit of the events of November 21st to kind of set the stage, and then I'll turn it over to my panel. You know, the, the, the Super Committee announced on the 21st that uh, they had failed to reach an agreement which they could reveal to the public. Now, that implies, astonishingly, that they reached an agreement that they could not reveal to the public. Um, we have been waiting for that agreement to emerge, and, uh, and I think we wait in vain. Uh, not because it doesn't exist, but because, in fact, they couldn't conclude it. The Secretary of Defense issued a statement the same day, reiterating a statement he had made many times before, that should sequestration occur, it would cause devastating effects on the Defense Department. And his term was, tear a seam in our national security capability. The President issued a statement that seemingly was from a different party, 
and a different administration than his own secretary, in which he said, I will veto any attempt to change this. Now, there is a common ground there. They both agree we need to achieve the $1.2 trillion in reductions. It's just the Pentagon says not in our package, and sequestration says au contraire, half of it is yours. Now, that half, of course, is not really $600 billion. It's really about $492 billion because we do save some money on interest payments by taking $1.2 trillion out, and the Pentagon doesn't have to pay that. One week before, the Secretary of Defense had sent a letter, which has been read by most of you, a letter to Senator McCain and similar letter to Senator Graham, explaining that devastating impact. And it had a nice three-page attachment. Now, those of you who have been watching Pentagon alarm bells go off over the decades know that when the Pentagon feels threatened, the thing they offer up as the consequence of that threat is exactly that which they will never do. We're going to kill the submarine. We're never going to build the next generation bomber. We'll cancel the Joint Strike Fighter. Now, these are the, the kinds of myths that create an illusion of impact. But the reality is that when it comes down to it, the military departments actually know how to do this quite well. In fact, their attitude, many of you have, in fact, said something like this in your own lives. You tell me what the number is and let me figure out how to reach it, right? Because I know how to do that. Well, yeah, you do know how to do that. But you know how to do it in such a way that it gambles on a future which is going to be different than you're predicting. You're hoping that in November, the president who wins is going to give you some of your money back. Or that the Congress, in its wisdom, will wake up and say, oh, we made a mistake. Defense, you really do need money. Now, I step back and I say to myself, we're in the defense business, so we're looking at DOD. And we're saying to ourselves, you know, you really ought to be doing a better job of planning for this than you're doing. The Secretary said, we're not going to plan for it, because if we plan for it, it'll become a self-manifesting outcome. Just imagine if we were not in the defense business, but instead we're in the education business, or the agriculture business, or the health and human services business. If you think DOD's got a problem, those guys have got a real problem. DOD actually, once it decides to plan for sequestration or future cuts, will know how to do it. The rest of the government doesn't have a clue. But that's not the purpose of today's discussion. Um, what's it all mean? That's why we call this panel together here. Um, to my right, Doug Holtz Aiken, former Council of Economic Advisors, director of the Congressional Budget Office. He's seen this from both the executive and legislative side. In fact, everybody up here has. Um, he's going to start off with a big picture and narrow it down to what our options are. Jim Dyer, who has been through it from the only thing that really matters, which is appropriations, because ultimately all the rest of this is just gobbledygook. It's what kind of money you actually get at the end that matters here. Uh, we'll give his view and interpretation of history. Um, Gordon Adams, who actually has made a career of looking at these things from the impact on real national security. And then uh, I'll wrap it up with a few thoughts on what does it mean for industry, because ultimately, as John Hamry said, the Defense Department does do things. But it does things by relying on industry to do it for them. And we need to pay attention to the impact of that as we go forward as there. So without any further uh, delay, I'm going to start by uh, turning the floor over to you. Can talk, you can talk from there. That'd be fine. Well, thank you uh, for the chance to, to be here. Uh, David asked me to talk about the big picture. And um, the result is that uh, I'm about to say unrelentingly negative things for about the next five minutes. And I apologize in advance. I mean, I'm a former director of the CBO. It is my job to stand up in public and say apocalyptic things about the budget outlook. but. Um, it's even worse than, than usual. So he, here's the problem in a nutshell. Uh, if you look at the, the President's budget that he put out uh, earlier this year, uh, it shows that we're running a deficit this year of about $1.3 trillion. Uh, and that's you know, uh, uh, close to 9% of GDP. Uh, and we have uh, a gross debt to GDP ratio of 100% uh, right now. Now, historically, countries that have debt uh, levels above 90 percent of GDP uh, have two characteristics. They, number one, pay a growth penalty of about a one percentage point a year. So we're, we're already feeling the effects of this, and that lowers the total resources available for all the things we'd like to do in the United States. Uh, and, and number two, they have a higher probability of sovereign debt problems. And uh, the U.S. has literally all the characteristics of countries that get in trouble. We have big debt levels. 
Uh, we have um, a heavy reliance on short-term borrowing. We have uh, new, not well understood contingent liabilities to pop up all the time. Look at the FHA, we're gonna have more housing problems. Look at the student loans, we're gonna have student loan problems. Or go to the state and local governments with their pensions. These are, these are all the characteristics of, of countries that get in trouble. That's the good news. Now the bad news <laughs> is that if you look forward over the next 10 years, those deficits uh, do not narrow. In fact, if you go out 10 years under that budget, at a time in 2021 when it is presumed we are fighting no overseas military operations, when the memory of the, the financial crisis is a distant one, the economy is back to full employment and, and ticking along, and the president has been able to raise all the taxes that he's wanted to in his budget. So revenues are now 19.5% of GDP. Uh, in, in that budget, we are still running a deficit of $1.2 trillion. And uh, that's almost 5% of GDP, and 900 billion of it is interest on previous borrowing. We are in a debt spiral. So that's, that's, that's the, the situation in which we find ourselves. And that's the situation that was true in August when uh, the, the, the Budget Control Act was passed and it, and it claimed to have $917 billion in, in cuts. Remember, those are, are cuts that are basically things like saying, honest, in 2018, we are going to spend less than we were before. Really, this time we mean it like never before, honest. And then they signed. So they, nothing changed in August. And then the super committee came and went and failed. And so we are now looking at a sequestration process to take off $1.2 trillion. And if it goes through as planned, we will still have an enormous problem. That will take care of roughly a quarter of the problem at best. And we will be back at this again and again. Now, what is this that we should be doing? Well, it turns out there, there are actually some lessons of history from this. If you look at the countries who have had the US problem, which is big debt, bad growth, the lessons of history are that you should keep taxes low and reform them if at all possible to be more pro-growth, and you have to cut spending. But not all spending is created equal. Those countries that have been successful preserve the spending in core functions of government, national security, infrastructure, basic research, education, all the things that in the United States are located in the discretionary spending categories, and they cut instead transfer programs, which in the United States means entitlement programs, the mandatory spending on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the new Affordable Care Act. And so um, the, the sour uh, aftertaste of bad politics is going to be bad policy in the United States. We are going to use sequestration to go again at the discretionary accounts and leave out, by and large, the mandatory spending that is exactly the wrong thing to do from the lessons of both the history where we need to grow faster and, uh, and from the, the, the point of view of national defense. And so, um, I, I don't have anything super great to report this morning, um, except that uh, we, we have a big problem. It's a problem we control. We, we control our destiny here. This is not something hitting the United States from the outside. And we, kn we know what the right thing looks like. Uh, we just have to get the politics to align with the lessons of the policy in the past, and, and that's the challenge we face uh, going into 2012. And one would hope that we will not see the sequestration take place as, as it's currently written, but instead we'd make wiser cuts and bigger cuts that actually address the problems we have. And so I'll, I'll just close there and let someone who's got better news take over. <laughs> Thank you, David and uh, Doug, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, an honor for me to be with you this morning. First, I must say that uh, being strategically placed to Doug's right and Gordon's left should generate a number of confusing sentences out of my mouth <laughs> and should place me strategically in the vital center of American history and uh, in a position to virtually contradict everything everybody else has to say. But we'll try to put some order into it. Um, I want to talk to you briefly about sequestration and David insists that I talk about appropriations and I will get there. Um, because I um, was born and bred around the Appropriations Committee, I have a healthy disrespect for virtually every tool in the Budget Act. <laughs> but I can't think of anything I have less respect for than the concept of a sequestration. To me, it's like a man who buys a chicken farm to raise a better breed of chicken, and then he proceeds to cut all the chicken's heads off. It just doesn't make sense, and indeed, I'm I am constrained to, uh, in, in, in doing a bit of research before appearing with you today, I, I, 
came across a great quote uh, from former Senator Phil Graham, the author and the godfather of Graham Rudman Hollings, which back in 1985, I believe it was, or 86, gave us the concept of a sequestration. And Senator Graham, as late as last month, said, and I paraphrase him, that sequestration was never meant to be anything more than a threat, an encouragement, a prod, I believe was the word he used, to force policymakers to do things through regular processes that they should be doing all along. And indeed, if you view sequestration that way, it gives you some hope that this is this, this threat that basically hangs over the budget process is, is little more than that, a threat, but also an invitation to, uh, to Congress, to the executive branch, and to policymakers to go back at it and try again. I'm also critical of sequestration because I don't think it's been a t it has a terribly great track record in this country. When it was put in place early on, to the best of my recollection, there were about five sequestrations that actually kicked in. Two of them, and this should give us great hope for the future, were actually overturned by subsequent laws. The third one was actually put in place by the act itself, so we got a sequestration as soon as we got Graham Rudman Hollings. But the fourth and fifth ones were the most fun and interesting of all. One of them resulted as a result of a drafting error in my old committee. And indeed, once we fixed the, fixed the drafting error, the sequestration went away. The third one had to, the fifth and final one, and the final, the last gasp of sequestration took place when one year we wrote a supplemental, and the supplemental exceeded the budget cap. So we did what we always do on appropriations. We take a trillion dollars and we cut it by point oh 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 one, And we found that to get under the sequestration cap, we cut $13 for about every million dollars we had in the budget, and somehow it worked out all right. Now, I, I also am constrained to remind you that this is the day, these were the days when a billion dollars was a lot of money, unlike today. And Doug gave you the statistics of what we're dealing with. We're now dealing with trillion dollar numbers, and if you can't come up with trillions in savings, you really are not making a material contribution to our current let, uh, uh, debt problem. Back in the day, we were in the billions of dollars. And the largest sequestration we ever got, one written by a law, was, I believe, about $11 billion. And everything else was reduced accordingly. So this has not proven itself to be an effective tool of budget reductions. But it has proven itself to be basically what Senator Graham, its author, said it would be, which is a threat to prod the system into doing something. Now, David alluded to the fact that uh, the Defense Department has, and I believe this is true, a great capacity to manage whatever they're given. I have to say to you that one of the things that troubles me as a Congress watcher is uh, uh, about next year, and I firmly believe that uh, a legislative adjustment, we'll call it for the want of a better phrase, is necessary here to obviate the effects of a sequester, but not just on the Department of Defense. And I know this is not our area, and I won't go too deep into it, but if you look at the effects of a sequester on the non-defense community, where virtually everything that is in growth in this country has been taken off the table, then you can really get scared. I wouldn't want to be sitting in the Education Department or the Labor Department and being confronted with the types of dollars that they are being confronted with. So this is, a, this is a problem in our context in that if tomorrow morning a decision was made by the powers that be in the Congress to say, look, let's try to solve this problem. Let's do what the Secretary of Defense wants. Let's do what we want to do, and let's see if we can fix this thing again. The first thing you encounter is the natural blowback from the other side that says, hey, what about us? You're going to try to fix us too? The answer is we have to. So it, it begs a follow-on question, and every time I beg a question, the questions become worse. And that is, if you couldn't do it in a non-election year, what makes you think you can do it in an election year? Well, the answer to that is the threat, the threat of the sword of Damocles has really not been re removed from your head. It's just been put off. And we all know that kicking a can down the road, something we all learned as children, 
is a more than acceptable legislative tool. And it's the type of thing that we do here all the time, but it's the type of thing that has to be revisited. I would argue that it has to be done. What I can't argue right now with you is A, the timing, or B, the vehicle of whether or not it would be done. There was some movement, if you will, in the waning days of this Congress to try to address the issue that movement has evaporated. I think that's probably wise. There are some other options next year, and again, we're in an election year, and remember, we all hate each other. Uh, we, we are in an environment where we could reactivate uh, the Budget Act. It's been dormant now for three years, and try to do something there. We could uh, do it as part of our beloved appropriations process. We can't do that without the blessing of the leadership, or we could do it as they walk out of town and give them one last present to the American people, which is that we have saved a number of agencies and a number of programs from being taken down, yet at the same time we've walked away from the most, arguably the most important economic problem facing the country. So none of this is easy. In fact, it gets progressively harder as the can gets kicked down the road. But I, I would have to say to you again, I would hearken back to the notion that this is a uh, with adversity comes opportunity here, and I would hope that everybody would reflect on the origins of this whole concept. The origin of the concept is to do what we expect and what we believe that this leadership and this Congress should do, which is to get back to the table and try this thing again. You didn't talk about appropriations. I was hoping to uh, get a little more time to think about what I was going to say. Oh, that um, <laughs> that's trouble. Asking me, to, handing out appropriations to me is really trouble. Um, I want to make, let's, uh, I want to build, in a, in a sense, build on, on, on where uh, Jim left off uh, and where Doug Holtz-Aiken started. Um, and I guess, uh, well, I want to say several things. First of all, first off, I don't think a sequester will happen. I completely agree with uh, Jim's interpretation of why sequester was designed and what it was intended to do. Um, when the Budget Control Act was passed on August 2nd, I think it was August 3rd, that I wrote a blog piece that said this is designed to fail. Uh, I hate to tell you I was right. No, I don't really hate to tell you I was right. I was actually <laughs> appreciated the fact that I was right. Breathed a sigh of relief when the super committee failed. Uh, but only because I expected it to fail. Um, it, I don't think it was designed to succeed in the beginning. Uh, and I think the crucial indicator to me that it was not designed to succeed was planting the actual implementation of a sequester in January of 2013. When that date popped out of the legislation, it was pretty clear that they were prepared to accommodate the fact that this might fail and that we would have a really wonderful time for the 12 months between its failure and the election. Uh, because, strangely enough, I'm shocked, shocked to learn there's politics going on in this place. Uh, as John Hamry said, the politics of this were about duking the issues out in the election campaign. So we have been treated to what I would describe as, a, and have described as an Indonesian shadow play uh, for the last three months, and are likely to continue to watch this piece of theater. Uh, and I do some theater around town, as you may know, so I'm somewhat familiar with the concept of theater. Uh, we will continue to have this theater going on for the next 12 months, uh, right through the election campaign. The only data points to me that ever mattered in the Budget Control Act were the caps for 2012 and 2013. Those struck me at the time as real numbers. Uh, they strike me in the process as the process has evolved as real numbers. Uh, they sent a very clear message in the first case to the appropriators. I will mention the appropriators which is don't you move a goddamn inch over $684 billion for these security agencies. Uh, that's a real cap. I was at OMB for five years during caps, know what that's like. Not fun, but you're, it's a cruel discipline, but you learn to live in it. And it told the White House, if you come up here in 2013 with a budget for these agencies that goes over 686, don't. Think twice, come back with a budget that doesn't go over 686. Now those two numbers that struck me were very, very hard very real, and the system is responding. The regular routine business that John talked about is responding to those numbers and doing its business. And we've had that kind of discipline before, just as we've had sequesters before. But the sequester part never struck me as terribly serious 
as an actual form for getting the budget down. Uh, I, I see it and have always seen it much more in the context that Phil Graham described it, which Jim has reiterated, as a sort of sort of Damocles over there saying, you guys better behave, get back to normal business and do your job. The system just isn't ready to do its job, as John was underlining. Uh, it's not ready to do it yet, and we'd rather spend the next 10 or 12 months playing, running the Indonesian shadow play. If you don't know what that is, by the way, it's a white curtain backlit with people manipulating two-dimensional puppets, arms and legs, and out in the audience looking at the screen, it looks like people are fighting or making love or doing whatever it is that they're doing, although it's only two-dimensional puppets that are being manipulated. That's why I use the image. Uh, there's a lot of this that is imagery, but not really yet the substance of what needs to be done. Um, we're not talking much about what a sequester would mean. We're not talking, aside from Pinetta's letter, we're not talking much about how it would actually happen. I'm intrigued, but I think Jim may be able to enlighten me a little bit about the applicability of this by something called Section 2 U.S. Code 907C, which happens to be part of the original Graham Redmond Hollings Act, uh, which actually allows the President to inform the Congress in a sequester message that he is redistributing within 050 the allocation of sequester amounts. And that it gets communicated to the Congress, hasn't happened, we would get communicated to the Congress, and requires a joint resolution under expedited procedure and a five-day kick out from the appropriators, because it's referred to the appropriators, to allow the President to actually adjust in 050 the consequences of a sequester. So the authors of Graham Redmond Hollings weren't entirely stupid. They s appear to have written a partial backdoor in 050, which would say while that number would happen, and it's about $52 billion, it can happen in a variety of ways. The President has to make the case. So even if we get to a sequester, which I doubt, there may be some more greater flexibility than we think, even than the Secretary of Defense has alleged. Uh, whether or not the shadow play continues, uh, this, I think, for me, is the bottom line. Whether or not a shadow play continues, whether or not we have a cacophony over the next 10 or 12 months of what's going to happen on Capitol Hill and in the election campaign by May, it'll all be in the election campaign, uh, we are going to see the defense budget go down. That's the bottom line to me. The bottom line here is not really will there or won't there be a sequester. It's, to me, an annoying gnat of politics that I brush aside whenever I can. The real prospect here is the defense budgets are going down, and in my judgment, going down more than the $450 billion that the Secretary of Defense has talked about. Uh, and the reason I say that, and I, I would argue that oh, we'll, we'll get 10 years out from now and we'll look back and we'll look at that 2012 budget submission and its projection over 10 years and we will say, holy cow, we took a trillion to a trillion and a half dollars out of the 12 projection for 10 years. I don't say we didn't notice, we'll notice but we'll have done it year by year by year, not in one fell swoop, not in a 10-year plan that everybody sticks to because nobody in this town sticks to a 10-year plan under any circumstances, right? But it will happen year by year. Why do I say that? Because we've been there, done that. Even I've been there, done that. Spent five years at OMB being there, doing that. Uh, we have lived through build downs. In fact, I'm old enough to have lived through every build down we've done since the end of the Second World War. Now, it's true I was very young for the first one, right? But I was aware of Korea, and I was quite aware after Vietnam, and I was involved in the process after the end of the Cold War. So we have done this, and every time we do this, point to point, over time, we see a 30% reduction in DOD resources from the first year to the 10th year. That's what happens. The shape of that build down, the size of the wedge are different between 85 and 98, the last build down we did, under the impact of deficit reduction, was $1.6 trillion. Right. And the force that resulted from that was different. We took 700,000 people out of the active duty force. We took 300,000 people out of the civilian employment in the Pentagon. The budget itself went down 36% in constant dollars, <coughs> excuse me, over the 13 years. And the procurement budget went down 50% over the 13 years in constant dollars. So we've been there and we've done that, and the force that resulted was the force that used Saddam Hussein as a speed bump in 2003. So you can manage a build-down. We have managed build-downs, and you can manage 
a build-down. Why do we have to put up with this? Well, the reality was around the edges of what John Henry said in kicking this off, and it's really more on Doug Holtz Aiken's territory than anybody else's. It's because other things have become more important. Deficits, debt, jobs, the economy, education, health. If you do your Gallup poll every month, as they do, <clears throat> you'll find national security is way down the list. It's not a compelling issue. And we're very concerned about the crisis that Doug Holtz Eakin pointed to. When we're concerned about that kind of fiscal and economic crisis, in order to get agreement, and Graham Redmond Hollings is the classic example, you can't get a deal unless everything's on the table. You can't get a deal. It doesn't work budgetarily. It doesn't work politically. So even if we get fixes to the sequester process, and I know that there's massive efforts to do it. Buck McKeon wants to do it. John McCain wants to do it. Lindsey Graham wants to do it. Everybody wants to fix the sequester to protect defense. They can't pass it. They can't pass it because everything has to be on the table. That's the nature of the beast. If you want the votes, everything has to be on the table. So all of the stovepipe effort that people may make in our community to try to protect defense is not workable politically for those reasons. As a consequence, whatever the fix is, is going to, as Jim alleged, have to involve the other elements that are handled under the sequester in order to fix the process or adjust the process. So it won't happen. We've done it before. Um, and that's why it happens. Uh, we can talk and probably should a lot have a lot of discussion in the Q&A about what are the consequences here. We've done some numbers on this. If you look at the administration's assumption under the Budget Control Act as it now exists, and you project that over 10 years, defense continues to grow 16.8 percent in nominal dollars. Now that's below the rate of inflation slightly, but it continues to grow. If you take a sequester and accommodate that one-year plunge of $50 billion or so, in the out years, the projections leave defense growing 7 percent in nominal dollars. It's way below the rate of inflation. That's a cut. But it is not the end of Western civilization as we know it. It is a manageable process. Now, I've got some thoughts about where the management might happen, what happens with people, what happens with procurement. Uh, what happens on the management side. Let me just make one point about procurement just to keep us in a sort of context of perspective here. I mean, I expect the force structure to go down. We can talk about that and park a lot in the reserves. But on the procurement side, and this has industry implications, um, procurement in past build downs pays the price. There's no question about it. In the last build down, it was the heavy lifting of the last build down. It was the procurement budget that took a holiday. And we're being told today we can't afford a procurement holiday because we need to reset. There's a lot of defense professionals in the room, so I'm using shorthand here for those of you who need a roadmap. We'll talk afterwards. But we, we done, did a study. Russ Rumbaugh and our staff did a study a couple of months ago that we put out saying, what did we get for a trillion dollars over the last 10 years? Did we spend all of that money in the war, in operations and maintenance. And it's true, 75 cents on a, on a supplemental dollar go to O&M, because that's the big lifter when you're at war. But we spent a trillion dollars on acquisition. And what did the Army get to focus on the big reset issue? The Army got every Abrams through a modernization, every Bradley through a modernization, bought every striker it intended to buy, put a whole bunch of Humvees into up armoring, bought four times the ammunition for 9 millimeter handguns it intended to buy, and so on, and so on, and so on. In other words, quite smartly, the Army seized some extra money and did its reset. Right? So we have to go very carefully into what the procurement issue is. It's the next gen that is the generation that's the procurement issue. It's not reset. It's not extra dollars. So even the procurement issue has to be looked at fairly carefully to see what's required, but the dollars will go down. There are other things we can talk about, strategy issues, uh, what the review is doing, and so on. I don't want to go into that now, except as you may want to talk about it in questions and answers and discussion. So I'll leave it there. Basically, I don't think sequester will happen. There are ways to work with it. Build down is on the way. It can be managed. We've done it before. Thank you, Gordon, and thanks to each of you for, uh, for that. Let me make a, a couple of broad points and then talk a little bit about the impact on on industry. Um, I've got a chart up here. Andy, I don't know if you can scroll the 
camera over to it. The folks uh, on the web won't be able to see it because it's not set up for camera viewing, but at least you'll know what you're looking for when you go to the website. And it, this chart actually starts with defense spending in 1989, pretty much at the end of the Carter-Reagan buildup. These are in constant dollars, FY12 dollars, and so they have huge numbers on the left-hand side that we didn't recognize at the time, right? Um, and you'll see the buildup in the aughts, and it's mostly in OCO. That's the, the reddish color at the top. And you'll see the impact of the 2012 and 13 reductions of the Budget Control Act. That's the first two columns inside that dotted line box on the right-hand side. You've all got a, a copy of it to look at. And you see the potential impact of sequestration, which is that little line at the bottom there. It's still a lot of money at the end of the game, right? And if the Defense Department were a large corporate enterprise and its management were charged with finding that level of reductions, they would likely be able to say, yeah, I think we can figure that out. Either that or we'd find different management, right? That's not been what this Defense Department's reaction has been, in part because of some of the bureaucratic issues of how we would do this, right? Now, there's two categories I'd like to describe there. One has to do with timing. We all know that the sequestration is set up to take place on January 2nd, 2013. And we've talked about the year of fun and games we'll have between now and then, actually 13 months. Um, most of that fun and games will be focused around next November on the theory that we'll have a clear, unambiguous direction for the country that will come out of the election. Well, I've been through a couple of these, and it's never quite as clear and unambiguous as we thought it would be. Um, even 1964 and 1972, which were, felt like real thumpings at the time, turned out only had a lifespan of a few years. Um, but the reality is that if you're actually going to comply with the sequestration on January 2nd, you don't wake up on the morning of January 2nd and comply with it. Let's look at two issues. One is, in fact, civilian personnel. Now, those of you who have managed know that in order to terminate civilian personnel, you have a lead time of essentially about five months. First of all, you've got to terminate them before they go off the payroll, because you're going to be paying them on average about 90 days worth of leave. So you don't save any money until they're finished. Then you've got to give 60 days notice of termination in advance of that. So I'm now back to having two choices with civilian personnel if I'm the Defense Department. I'm either going to put out an announcement, well, maybe somewhere around July or August, that I'm going to fire 90,000 people, or I'm going to wait until January 2nd to put out that announcement, and I have to fire 200,000, because in order to meet my savings target, I've got to reduce a lot more people because they're not going to be gone until May. Now, that's one data point. At the same time, the President, under the law, has the authority to exempt military pay from sequestration. Now, the likelihood that he's not going to do so is zero, right? He can't actually exercise that exemption until the trigger kicks in, but he can certainly announce his intention to exercise that exemption at the appropriate point in time. When might that be? Well, it might be connected to the campaign. It might even be when he goes before the veterans of foreign wars to give his annual summer speech on or about the same day that we issue the notice that 90,000 civilians are being terminated will notify the military is not going to have any impact at all. Now, that's a, another dichotomy that's going to create an interesting dilemma publicly. Much of this is, in fact, looks like we've punted, but the ball will come down sooner than the play clock expects it to. Right? Now, the President also has, under the law, enormous additional authority. Secretary Panetta's letter explaining the consequences of sequestration takes the worst case scenario exactly the same percentage on every line item in the budget. And if you read the law, it gives the Defense Department and other agencies substantial authority to be more flexible in that regard. They have to have a justification and a rationale for it. They have to explain it. They have to document it. They have to report on it. But that flexibility is there, greater than previous sequestrations if they want to exercise it. We don't have any idea how to exercise it because that requires us to prioritize who dies and who lives. And the history of the Defense Department budget process is everybody lives just on a thinner diet, right? And some will make it, almost all will make it. This is ideal 
from the point of view of day-to-day -day management in the military departments because it's almost impossible for central authority and control to tell them what to do. Too many moving parts, too little time to figure it out. No strategic basis for prioritization. So if you look back at Secretary Panetta's letter and the three pages at the end of all the dire consequences, all right, and you think to yourself, well, ultimately, that's probably not what we're going to cut. We're probably going to cut something else. And this is regardless of whether it's through sequestration or through some other deal that says we'll find another place to get down to that blue line on the right-hand side there. We don't have a basic framework in which to say, how do we prioritize those? We won't get it between now and then. I'm not quite sure when we get it. But if you think out to 2030, the military capability that we're going to have in 2030 is what we are buying right now. The mid-career leadership that will be in place in 2030 is going through accessions right now. The recruiting that we're about to cut by 80 percent because we have great enlistment today, and I'm only predicting 80 percent because that's what we've done in the past when things were going well and we didn't have enough money, will in fact ignore the fact that we're recruiting a military that's not the kind of military we need to have, a military that's not representative of America. So there's a whole host of issues that come into play. What does it mean for industry, though? Secretary has been very clear in this. But we are not planning for sequestration. We are not going to build a budget that comes below the cuts that are mandated by the Budget Control Act. Don't do it, is what he said to the Pentagon. Right? Now, put yourself in the position of a program manager. You're going to know pretty soon what your FY12 number is. And you'll know pretty soon what your FY13 budget number is. And you'll know that it does not reflect that sequestration, because the P Pentagon says we're not going to plan for that, even though the President says I'll veto it if it doesn't happen. But the program manager is going to say, I think I need to be prudent here. You know, maybe I'll slow down my solicitations and my announcements. Maybe I'll slow down my awards. Maybe I'll be a little careful about exercising the next option. Maybe I'll use competition. Competition's a great tool, but sometimes competition for the sake of competition just buys me time. Right? It'll take me an extra nine months. Um, maybe I won't even be all that upset if somebody protests. Of course, I could be flip here and say I'm not sure you could tell the difference if the Pentagon were deliberately trying to set up a potential for protests or accidentally doing so. Um, but, the, the, uh, but the reality is I think you'll see a lot of slowing down on the procurement side. On the services side, the contracts are generally not top-down managed. They're bottom-up. Thousands of individual decisions on individual tasks by individual activities and sub-activities across the department. Much harder to slow that down. You can put a cap on spending. You don't know you've reached that cap until after you're past it. Right? So I actually think the hardware side of the business is going to see pretty dramatic impact in FY12 as people go slow. The services side, a little less so because it's just harder to control centrally. Right? In addition, of course, I think you'll continue to see the second part of the slowdown, which is the policies that say, we're not actually after your profit. We're really just after your costs. But the way we get after your costs is by going after your profit. And that's a statement that the Pentagon denies. But the reality of the day-to-day -day management of the contracts are consistent with such a policy, even if it's not what's being articulated. That's the dynamic you'll operate in. How do you get out of it? You get out of it when we get a deal. When do we get a deal? The votes aren't there. The votes are certainly not there between now and November. And the votes will only be there after November if something happens that's unexpected in November. Now, they will find some way out of this. Right? I'm not smart enough to figure out what that is. I am smart enough to think it's not going to be anytime soon. And in the meantime, be alert for those notices in July. So, um, with that, I think I'm prepared to throw the floor open to questions and comments. I think you all know the drill. We have microphones. Um, you raise your hand. You wait for a mic. Um, well, somebody will say, bring the mic to that person. And uh, you wait for the mic. You identify who you are and your affiliation. And then you're welcome to uh, uh, make your comments. and. We'd like to keep them kind of short, and hopefully there's a question mark somewhere near the end of them out there. Any uh, takers? Let's see. Let's start over on the 
Hang on, hang on for the mic, Dave. Dave Fulgen with Aviation Week, and I know this is hardware related, but I just would like your best guess. If, if sequestration goes through, do you think uh, that the choice will be then to cut the programs that are being worked on right now, JSF and Next Generation Bomber, and they will decide to leap uh, a generation of technology? And, and move on to uh, uh, more X-47-like um, programs or something uh, in that order? The, the, the question, let me, the mic didn't seem to kick in there, so let me, uh, uh, let me rephrase it or summarize it. It's uh, basically if sequestr sequestration kicks in, would the decisions of where to cut be essentially cut existing programs and keep alive future technology. My own sense is that would require a level of centralized guidance which will not exist. Um, and I think it's going to be a program by program decision rather than a, an, an aggregate basis. History says that we do keep funding in R&D accounts a little high. We don't cut them quite as fast as we cut procurement. Um, it also says we tend to cut the R part of R&D a little more than we cut the D part of R&D, which I think is a mistake, um, and, and it's possible that from a budgetary point of view we might predict that. But I don't think, Dave, that, that we have any basis for saying which programs go and which programs survive at this point in time. Gordon, you agree? Uh, I, I agree with that largely. It's interesting to me that in, uh, in 1989, it's important to remember that the last build down that we did uh, was in the majority carried out under the uh, George H.W. Bush administration, led by that notorious anti-defense advocate Dick Cheney uh, and Colin Powell. Uh, and they took, uh, Powell to this day takes great pride in taking 500,000 people out of the active duty force structure and uh, cutting the budget 25 percent. Um, the, the kickoff, however, interestingly, and in a way we may have already given at the bank with what Gates did, is was that, uh, was that Cheney uh, axed a bunch of programs. Uh, and some of them were very small actual pr programs in production. Some of them were very large R&D programs, uh, like the A-12. People remember the A-12. Um, the, and took great pride over those four years in saying he had done this to procurement. It's very clear, to come back to what I said earlier, that procurement does carry a heavy burden in a build down. It always does. And the question where it will happen is, is very apt. Uh, my sense is the response in major defense acquisition programs in general, generally I agree with Dave, this will be program by program, not as a blanket policy, but the experience seems to be in major defense acquisition programs where you can, you cut the buy and stretch the program. So instead of buying 2,300, you buy 2,100 and you buy them at a slower rate. Uh, rather than terminate the program. And we have so many contracts now that the price of uh, termination exceeds the, the savings that you might generate in the program that that's likely to be true for MDAPs. The place to look in the procurement budget, and it typically is looked at, is the non-MDAPs. It's not just other procurement, it's also smaller programs. Uh, and that's 60% of the procurement budget. So in that 60% of the procurement budget, you tend to get a lot of attention to things like the trucks and the front end loaders and the ammunition supplies and all of the things that don't have quite the same visible level of visibility and constituency in Washington and in the Congress and can be work hacked away at, if you will, can be drilled down. And you'll see, I think, in all of the services, a focus of attention on those uh, lesser procurement accounts that don't have quite the same visibility. Yeah, thanks. I'm Harlan Ullman. Thanks for uh, uh, <coughs> a very somber assessment, which I think everybody would agree. Um, I want to back into the question I want to ask. It seems to me that if you seek to find out what is the greatest threat facing us globally, I would argue it's not global warming, it's not radical Islam, it's not proliferation, on and on and on. It's bad governance. And here at home, we have adequate proof of that. Now, it's easy to come up with very, very dire apocalyptic views. I mean, Doug is absolutely right. We have this debt going on forever. The euro collapses. You know, it's going to be bad. But what makes you think today is much more dangerous 
or much more serious than, say, 1938 or 1939, or even 1975, 76. We had a president who got thrown out. We came out of Vietnam licking our wounds. And in those days, people thought that the all-volunteer force was going to be absolutely catastrophic. We can't come up with solutions for the reasons you point out right now because we're not going to get any kind of consensus. It could be done rationally, but that's probably not going to happen. <clears throat> so my question really is, why is today different? Why are we in more serious danger or not than we were in other periods in our history? So can, let me just be clear about what, what I intended to convey, which is the scale of the, pro the challenge that faces us um, and the immediacy. I, I think both of those are very real, and the notion that somehow it isn't a large problem or that it's somewhere in the future are both wrong. That doesn't mean we can't solve it, and I actually believe we will. I mean, in the end, historically, Americans have turned out to be very pragmatic people. We always look like we're ideologically divided, but we figure out a way to, to sort this stuff out, and, uh, and, and I actually am quite confident we will. Um, but uh, it's going to require something better than what we saw over the past six months, and I think we're fully capable of it, and once we get past the election, we, we'll do it. So if I could follow up, <clears throat> you're saying the situation today is not necessarily as serious as it was in 38 or 39 or 75 and 76. I, I don't know how to rank them. I think these, these, are, all, these are all terribly serious uh, circumstances. What we, I think what we know about our problem now is, is, is t just daunting. I mean, th these, we don't, the parts we don't know could make it even worse, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the situation we're in. I mean, right now we have the great virtue of being the best looking horse in the glue factory. And so, <laughs> but that could switch and, and that concerns me. I also have to add to, if I can add to that, I, pardon my suspicion about driving defense policy while wearing a pair of green eye shades. The issue of the threat, the issue of U.S. global commitments, the issue of power projection, all, all these, are, these are multiple issues. They don't necessarily lend themselves to people who say, oh, we have to take the budget down by $650 billion more in the next 10 years. One of the virtues, I think, of working up around appropriations is you get to be a linear committee and you get to look at it one year at a time. And you get to make the types of reductions in budgets that if I can make them in the first year, I can build automatic savings in the second year. Uh, Gordon alluded to it. And even the third year if I'm smart. But if I'm also smart, I'm very suspicious of where the experts tell me I'm going to be in five to ten years because I just don't know the threat. And I, tell, me, tell me five years ago if anybody in this room thought we would be in this position today. And the answer is no, we just don't know. So we've got to take it incrementally. That's a great to, segue. I have to, I have to uh, sorry, <laughs> let me just jump in on, on one thing. Uh, because, because Jim raised the suspicions of planning defense around a green eye shade, um, Bernard Brody, who was one of the great strategic theorists of all time, wrote back in 1959 a book on mar largely on nuclear policy. Uh, but he had a chapter in that I thought was intriguingly and intelligently entitled, which is strategy wears a dollar sign. And you think about the ambiguity of that statement but it's a necessary ambiguity that we always live with. There is no way to spend enough money in the Department of Defense to guarantee that you have full knowledge about what you're able to do everywhere in the world, and full knowledge that you're defended against every potential challenge, risk, threat, danger, whatever way you want to call it. And historically, outside of times of war, strategy has always been wearing a dollar sign. Uh, the problem, I think uh, Congress perpetuated this problem in asking the Defense Department to draw up a quadrennial defense review that was deliberately unhinged from resources, was that you get what we got in 2010, which is a strategy that's just a, 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 an IHOP layer of pancakes. Every mission counts, right? Every mission is equal, and risk has to be reduced to zero in all of them, which is an open recipe for bad planning, bad management, and bad defense. Uh, resource limitations are real. They will drive strategy in the same way that strategy drives resource limitations. They are interactive. You can't get away from the impact of one on the other. I, I would like to add one thing, Arlen, and I, I think your, your two historical periods of 38, 39, 75 are, are interesting and relevant. Um, clearly, the kind of existential threat that we faced in 1939 is not the same as what we face today. There's no comparison. But if you, if you look at that 
chart of defense spending, and if you superimposed on it the annual deficit, it actually doesn't scale on the chart because the chart only goes up to about 800 billion and the deficit is 1.3 trillion. And if you put on that chart the payment on the national debt each year, the payment on interest, it also, the chart by the time you get to the right, starts to lose its scale because you go over there. Um, that is, in fact, not replicated of where we were in the mid-70s at all. But the other element, and I think this is really key, is at its core, the national security establishment in both of those time periods knew what its number one priority threat was. They knew who it was. They knew where it was. They knew what they needed to be doing to get ready for it. Not completely, not all that well, and in fact, it took a little extra time. Today, we don't have any ground that we can stand on that says, this is how we make our choices. That's the scary thing. Which was uh, Greg Kiley, CSIS. That was my question. It, it, it's about the ramifications of the, of the loss of process. David, you were talking about how uh, in mid-12, uh, next year, we're going to start seeing this. Lead times for equipment. The Pentagon planning process, 13, they've ignored sequestration. They'll be trying to plan all of 12 for 14. If they're going to ignore sequestration then, too, we're looking at two, three, four, five years, possibly, of, of no planning discipline, let alone there hasn't been the last past decade. So the question is, uh, I mean, how much longer into the future are we going to have to deal with the ramifications of the problem if we've lost discipline? Greg, let me just say something to you that I find just personally interesting. I, I understand full well the decision of the Department of Defense to prepare a 2013 budget independent of sequestration. It's polit John Hammer used the word politics, so I guess we get to use it in here. It was a political decision, and I understand it totally, and I, were I in their shoes, I would probably make the same decision. But look forward to next year. I, I'm going to take issue with everybody here who says you can't fix sequestration. I think you can. But, but if you can't fix it, you're going to spend the next year campaigning on it and talking about it. And does anybody around here think that the issue of the number of lost jobs in and out of government is not going to be raised? I, I, I can't believe that that's not going to be the case. So the Pentagon's posture is going to be it has to hunker down. And at some point in time, and you're all familiar with the planning processes to put the next budget together, at some point in time, somebody's going to have to develop an alternate scenario over there of what happens if nothing works and we get hit. And the question is, how long does that alternate scenario stay out of the public eye? And when it hits the public eye, how does the public receive it and respond to it? I, I have always felt, and I still feel, if there is a glimmer of hope on modifying sequestration, it would have to come not just from the likes of us, but it would have to come from some kind of public perception that national security may be threatened, that this is not wise public policy, that this is a potential election issue. It would have to well up from someplace else after having been properly massaged by others. But I, I've always felt that would have to happen. And I think then uh, maybe a lesson gets learned and, and <coughs> scenarios get developed and options get done. But, but the process, uh, I, I'm sorry to say this, but I'm afraid that Congress may be making a major contribution in weakening this process because as our processes in the Congress decline and deteriorate to virtually nothing, which is where they are now, any agency dependent upon the ability of the Congress to send it information is not going to be able to plan. Let me give you the worst case scenario on the budget. Last spring, we passed the 2011 appropriations bill, which were based largely with some modifications on the 2010 numbers. The 2012 numbers that we will pass uh, here, hopefully within two and a half weeks, will be based upon baseline adjustments of the 2011 numbers. Meanwhile, the Pentagon is preparing the 2013 budget. We also have a threat of sequestration, and we have a very dim prospect that the 2013 budget will be done in the next fiscal year, so that will give the Pentagon the opportunity to prepare the 2014 budget. Now we're into five years, and we're still working off of a modified baseline of five years ago. 
i don't know how anybody plans i don't know how a business could plan that i don't know how a pentagon could plan that way but that is the dilemma we are forcing upon these people by the fact that we can't clean up our processes to make theirs work i take a crack at some of that question because i think it's a very a very good question but let me start uh... with uh... where we are today and and what is acceptable I find it quite interesting to note that if we had had this conversation two years ago, the concept that $450 billion would disappear from the 10-year plan at DOD would have been shocking to people. And one of the, con one of the natures of a build-down is that the, the mental adjustment that everybody makes in their numbers about what's acceptable, what Panetta succeeded in accomplishing at the Department of Defense is to bring everybody on board with the concept that what they thought they were going to have last year over 10 years is going to be $450 billion less, which, by the way, is only 8 percent, but nonetheless $450 billion less than what they thought they were going to have. You know, the, the change in expectations that you, as you go through a build-down is quite remarkable, and it happens, as Jim is alleging, year by year. That adjust, those adjustments happen year by year. Uh, and we're going to have this shadow play in the middle of it this coming year of a sequester. And you don't have it with a lot of strategic planning uh, helping you drive the train here. As I say, strategy wears a dollar sign, so very often you don't have a lot of strategic planning driving the train here. I swear to God, if, we had, if Dick Cheney had said in 1989, 10 years from now you're going to have $1.6 trillion less than you thought you were going to have right now this year, somebody would have fired him. The politics would have been uproarious, but that's what happened. That is, in fact, what happens, and it happens year by year. Now, I, I'll say something here that I, I know will fly in the face of the expectations of a lot of people, those of us who work in the defense stovepipe. But in, with the end of the war in Iraq and with the gradual withdrawal from Afghanistan, which I thoroughly expect is going to happen, in a weird kind of way, we're in very secure position globally. Uh, and while the rhetoric will tell us it's an increasingly dangerous world and there are threats all around us, I simply don't believe that's an accurate analysis of the United States security situation in the world today. We do not face an existential threat. I agree with Harlan, bad governance is probably a worse threat than anybody is facing in the world. Uh, I don't want this to become a China panel. I was on one two days ago and it was all about China, but the Chinese capability right now is minuscule compared to our capability. The technological lead we have is two or three generations ahead in every area of equipment. Uh, we could just go on and on. The security situation, you know, we're not going to invade every fragile state. We're not going to invade Pakistan. We could have a long discussion about strategy, but the reality is for all the troubles in the world, the United States has a very secure position, a very dominant military capability, a lot of problems it faces, most of which are susceptible not to kinetic use but to non-kinetic tools which sadly go down even more than defense tools when you're in a build down. Uh, and as a result, in an odd kind of way, it's one of those periods where we can buy a certain amount of strategic disjuncture, of uncertainty about exactly what the focus of national security planning ought to be or needs to be, and we do have some time to do that. That said, m it's hard to read the tea leaves here on what the strategy review currently underway is going to come out with, and many of you in the audience may know a great deal more about that than I do. But my sense is they can't but confront the likelihood that we are going to diminish the priority being given to coin and nation building and stabilization missions as part of a strategy review. And that produces some opportunities for savings. Uh, that they'll take another look at what the nuclear force design is going to be. Uh, that they will focus, surprise, surprise, on Asia and the Pacific as a region in which our security interests are long-term seriously engaged. Those are at least three areas where I expect people are doing some thinking about how strategy needs to relate to this, and I'm sure that's being <coughs> briefed into the budget planning process that people are doing. The budget planning process is also necessitating some of those choices. Strategy wears the dollar sign. So there is an interactive relationship here. Not quite sure where that's going to come out some strategic thinking going on, but I think we have a reasonably good period in history to think seriously about how we want to pivot our whole national security strategy. I, I, I just have to add a point. Gordon has said a couple of times strategy has a price tag. I agree with that. But it's a price tag we've paid. We've done it, I've been in this town 40 years, and I can't remember 
under the general principle of contingency budgeting, when our military or our country has had to involve ourselves in an activity overseas where they haven't sent the bills to the Congress and the Congress has paid them. And I think, uh, and, and you know, if you say, oh, Jim, that's not they're very significant, trust me, it is so significant that if you watch the Congress on a daily basis, you'll find that waiving the Budget Act often gets more attention than the Act itself because they'll waive the Budget Act for anything. And they will waive the Budget Act and they will go through the roof if they have to to guarantee security strategy. And I also have to say, um, I'm always amused by people who say, oh gosh, we have statutory caps. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it's, it's virtually a meaningless statement because we've had caps now since 1974 and the only time we've had the caps lifted is when the joint leadership of the United States Congress and the President has said lift the caps. So we've been, we've been working under these numbers comfortably. If they have to be taken up for contingency planning, absolutely do we do them. And we don't flinch. We don't worry about it at all. Indeed, one of the frustrations, I think Gordon shares this with me because we have some common interests about the 150 accounts in the budget, about the foreign assistance accounts. If I could find a way to get the people who work in the 150 account to be as well received and well cared for on the Hill as I could for the people who work in the 050 account, I'd feel like I'd done something good. But there is, there is a different standard, and the standard that exists on the Hill today is we take care of our troops. But not only do we take care of our troops and our troops' families and our troops' education and our troops' health and our troops' rehabilitation, but we take care of the things necessary to protect them physically and to help them do their mission. And, and that has not, that, that type of budgeting, that type of security planning on the Hill has never really been a problem. If, if the agency plans for them and they talk about them, we'll pay those bills. I'm not, I'm not going to offer a rebuttal, although I have one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said that nice thing about foreign aid. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. There, there is a lot of value in process for its outcomes. And, but there's also value in process for being able to sustain the capacity to do the process. It may be that we don't really need a good planning process today because the future we face in the near term, we should be able to take care of America's defense interests pretty well for $500 billion a year in constant dollars. Right? Almost everybody in this room would agree with that. But if we lose the capability to actually match our resources and our capacity in a forward-looking way, it's really hard to get it back. I look at DOD today and I'm concerned that by and large we've already lost that capability. The number of general officers who've actually participated in building a fiscally disciplined future year defense program is remarkably small because we haven't done it in quite a while. And when you lose that capability, you don't even know what it is you've lost. Now, can we muddle through? Absolutely. Will, will, is America about to go under? No way. Right? Will we do a lot of stupid things? You bet. And we'll do more of them as a result of that. And of course, you know, it should be that our goal, actually, there was a great headline in, in one of the trade papers a few weeks ago of an Army three-star giving new acquisition guidance to the community. It says, let's stop doing things that are stupid. Now, that is great acquisition guidance. And I <laughs> firmly endorse it, right? But manifesting it is a little harder than just saying it. Right? Uh, let's see. We got a... I, I think I saw a, a hand in the back, although it may be that that question is so irrelevant now that it's no longer, uh, that hand will no longer be going up. We've got one on the right here, uh, Terrence, if you would bring the mic over there. On my right, your left. Thanks. Uh, Kate Brandon, Defense News. Do you think um, the conflicting messages from Secretary Panetta and President Obama is an effective strategy to get Congress to act, or is it just confusing everybody? I think it's confusing. Uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary Panetta came out of the box early and often, and I think largely the defense community applauded him. He was followed on by the President's uh, rather firm statement that he would uh, uh, veto any tinkering of a sequester unless it was uh, paid for by other uh, offset activities. Um, I think the message it sent to the Hill and everybody else was a little confusing and leads one to wonder 
what the administration's posture would be towards a fix. I think anybody who has listened to Secretary Panetta and who has read his writings knows where he is. Uh, I, the confusing part uh, for me is I don't know if the President is – I understand politically why the President would hold the line here, but I also think the President may be sending a message that uh, this is not a freebie and that he, the President, has uh, uh, reductions he wants too and that uh, if you're going to do one thing, you're going to have to do the other. And, and maybe there's more consistency in the message at the end of the day than you might think, but up front I thought it came out very confusing. Um, I, I, I've forgotten who it was who, who said, and I'm going to get the paraphrase wrong, but uh, that uh, wisdom is being uh, able to hold two completely contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time and still go on working. Um, I, I, I'm somewhat more cynical than, than somebody who worked for many years on the Appropriations Committee, which somewhat staggers me. Um, but, I, but in this case, uh, I, I, I read this as a classic good cop, bad cop. Um, that there's one set of messages that has to come from the White House, there's another set of messages that has to come from the Pentagon, and if you think those two parts of the government aren't talking to each other about the messages, got news for you, stay in town a little while longer. Um, they are, I, I, I don't know that this is a coordinated effort, I can just tell you that this sounds to me like good cop, bad cop, and the President, and this is I think the bottom line for me in this whole situation, the President has a bigger terrain of battle that he fights on than the Secretary of Defense. So that the ultimate resolution here has to come from everything else being on the table. One of the trigger points that I think is important to look towards after the election is what happens to the expiring 2001 tax cuts, because that's a card on the table. Uh, and after the election, depending on where the dust is, it's a card that's certainly to, to be dealt in some way. But that's the terrain presidents deal on. Presidents deal on that bigger turf. And so the signal that I think Obama is sending has to be, at this point, different from the signal the Secretary is sending. I, I would ask you, just as a footnote to Gordon's comments, to think about January 1 of 2000, of calendar 2013, when the Bush tax cuts expire and taxes go up and trillions of revenue flow into the system. And what is it, January 2 or January 3? I can't remember which, but that's the day the sequester kicks in, the one we can't fix. That's the one where the RIF notices have to hit the street. That's the one where the contractors have to hunker down. That's the one where the unemployment rate goes up. That's the one where everybody starts to worry again. It's a nice way to start the new calendar year. <laughs> and it ought to give, it ought to give, that's right, Happy New Year. It ought to give policy planners from the President on down uh, a lot of thought about where they're going to kick off, whether it's this president or the next president's inaugural year, because it all falls in the first two or three days. Kate, I, I think there's another aspect to that question that we really haven't touched on much today. Unlike any other drawdown we've faced, any other time we've wrestled with this, there's a big player lurking at the edge of the room that wasn't there before, and that's the global financial markets. And I think the President's comments, and you can interpret some of Secretary Panetta's comments the same way, is as much a message to the ratings agencies as it is to the politics. Because if you look at the impact of the Super Committee's failure, it had zero impact from a global financial market point of view. Why? Because ultimately the bottom line was going to come down exactly the same as if they had reached a deal. Either they had a deal for $1.2 trillion or we were going to cut the $1.2 trillion. The reason that you have to hold that is because the last thing the President wants in the middle of a re-election campaign is for Moody's to downgrade the U.S., right? And that, that, you know, of all the messages you can't control as political campaigner, that's the one we've most got to maintain. And I think it's the presence of those people in the room. They weren't there in 1938 and 39. I don't think Franklin Roosevelt ever got up in the morning and said, wow, I wonder if the radio agencies are going to downgrade us today. They weren't there in 1975, Gerald Ford did. They weren't there in 1989 when Dick Cheney was starting down the road of we're going to cut. Right? They are there today, and we can't ignore that. I, I think we're getting close to the end of our time. I've got perhaps time for one last question. Uh, how about in the back, Otto? Otto Kreischer with National uh, Journal uh, Daily. Uh, would you like to hear the panel say what's 
the possibility of Congress using the OCO account, which they've done repeatedly in the past, you know, to uh, to cover things that they couldn't uh, come up with in, inside the base budget. You know, is that a is that an avenue to you know kind of cover their their tails in uh, in tw twelve and thirteen? Uh, already I, already being done. Yeah, it's already being done. I would <laughs> I would say to you, it, it's been a that's been a constant in budgeting uh, for some years now, and indeed the Pentagon has been a past master, and they've had help in the Congress uh, from doing things, especially for the Army and the Marines in the OCO accounts that might not have passed the smell test of being in the base budget. But if you look at those numbers, they're coming down. I think the, um, the OCO account in defense that hopefully will pass here within the next two weeks, probably going to be the neighborhood about, about uh, uh, it's gone down to about 120. It's um, so 118, 119, yeah, and that's from a, from a high of 400. So I think we're going south in that account. I, I think long range you will not solve a lot of problems as long as you're reducing your level of activity in, Af in, in the Middle East and the Near East. That bank's going to go away. I agree with what Jim said. But until it goes away, we're going to use the heck out of it. <laughs> all right. So I want to thank you all for your time and attention and presence this morning. I want to thank those of you who joined us on the web. Um, as Dr. Hamry mentioned, uh, this is not an issue that we put our feet up and say, okay, that's done, now what? Uh, we'll be wrestling with this question both here and elsewhere in Washington for the next year, perhaps for the next 10 years, perhaps for the rest of our lives. Most of, them hope, most of us hope that's longer than 10 years. And, 